Hello Legends, today I catch up with Cub member and my new friend, Corbin Barry, the CEO of Annandale Dental and Darlinghurst-based dental clinic, Sage Space. Corbin is an incredible guy. He's taken an old traditional industry and he's made it his own, right? He's um, created going, he's made going to the dentist an experience, a wow experience that attracts customers that he actually wants to serve. And I think that's just an incredible thing that every business can learn. How can you take your industry, make it your own and attract customers that you actually want to serve, people that you get along with. Plus, he's taken on a huge challenge, the, an issue that the health sector in general has, which is to fix problems when they arise. Corbin doesn't want to do that. He wants to prevent them from ever happening. And he wants to focus on that in dental work. I think he's incredible. I think that's an incredible mission. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I've heard a lot about you. You're Cub's uh, most famous dentist. <laughs> Apparently so. Yeah, yeah. You might be our only dentist, actually. <laughs> no, I think one joined recently, but I still take the top spot. Motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you're the best. Um, 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 well, who's the new guy or girl? I'm actually not sure. Yeah, I, I should find out. Yeah. We should have more people in health. I, I think that space is just such a, like, I think it's the next big space. Like, I was even talking to Boris about it, mm. uh, to Mark. And he is obsessed with the health space. He's even launching Project 100, which is uh, a company that basically is going to help people have the information and supplements and things to live to 100 years old. Yeah, interesting. And have you noticed recently everyone's getting sick? Like, yeah. And when they get sick, they get sicker. Like yeah. it's not like no one's just got the cold anymore. Yeah, no. It's like the flu, everything's hitting people really, really hard. Yeah. The moment. Yeah. So I just think health is the this, is, is this space. And like I was reading about your company, um, Sage Space, and – um, I, I, I really loved that you were talking, like your focus was preventative. Yeah. So we, we want to stop you from having, from getting sick from, in your mouth. You know, we want to keep your mouth healthy and, and we don't want to just fix things when they happen. We want to prevent. I think if the whole world looked at health from a preventative standpoint and also a logical standpoint, mm. that like we would all just be so much better off. 100%. I think that though a lot of our training is – with doctors and dentists and healthcare professionals is all about treatment. We're not, we, we learn about the preventative aspects of health, but we're still there to treat disease. And I think there has to be a mind shift to say that prevention, especially within the dental realm, which is what I know so well, we don't need to have dental decay. We don't need to have fillings in our teeth, but yet we still have it because the focus has always been treatment over prevent preventative care. And do you think that focus would have happened because there's more money in solving? Like, it's like, oh, my God, my tooth hurts. I'll pay $3,000 to have my tooth fixed. Yeah. You know, as opposed to my mouth feels fine. Should I really go to the dentist? I think like a couple of aspects. I think when you look at like university education for dentistry particularly, most dentists will get into the industry, and this is probably a controversial point, for the lifestyle. It's a good lifestyle. You graduate after four to five years. You can be whatever you want. You can work nine till five, and you live this perfect life. Medicine, on the other hand, you get into medicine, and you know that for 15 years you're hustling to get to where you want to be. So most junior doctors, when you ask them, why did you get into medicine? It's, I want to help people. So it's this real difference in why people are getting into these different industries. Um, I think also dentists love a challenge. So the idea that we're drilling and filling and we're doing things that are more complex than your preventative checkup and clean excites us. It's something that's a bit harder. It's not mundane. It's not the day-to-day -day chore of what we do. And I think that that's why both monetary but also technically dentists love doing treatment. And how did you, I mean, did you always want to be a dentist or how did you get into dentistry? Yeah, I always thought I wanted to be a dentist. It wasn't, it was, sorry. No, I was going to say, you don't really look like a dentist. Like, yeah. You look kind of cooler. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a dentist, an architect or a pilot. And again, lifestyle drew me to dentistry. Um, but from the age of 12, I worked in hospitality. Like I always was passionate about creating something for myself. And I think dentistry, I had a charismatic orthodontist who was larger than life, knew everyone, had a well-oiled ship that he was running up on the Gold Coast. And that kind of drew me to this idea that I wanted to be that one day. Um, 
going through dental school, like I went through my ups and downs as well. Like you start learning the intricacies of dentistry and you're like, oh, what am I doing? But then I wanted to always look outside the box of how we could make a difference and make a bit of a change from, as you said, I don't look like a dentist. And so hopefully I don't talk like a dentist, act like a dentist, all that aspect. Yeah, I mean, no offence to dentists. <laughs> yeah. just, Lovely people. Yeah, really. I mean, some of the <laughs> they best. try really hard to be nice. Well, they're some of the best people. <laughs> yeah. And and so you got into dentistry. Did you set up your own clinic straight away or did you work within dentists? So I graduated um, in 2014. I looked at areas around Sydney that I wanted to be based. So I looked at demographics of people that were living in the area and I basically like cold emailed a bunch of practices and said, hey, I'm graduating, do you have a job? Um, it's just so happened that my first practice, which I now own, Annandale Dental, um, that practice offered me a job. And he actually said to me when I first started, he's like, I want to sell my practice. And I said, I don't even know how to be a dentist yet. I just need to work. Um, he was a little bit out of touch with um, everything at the time. So I actually ended up saying no to a job with him worked at a bunch of different practices. I have an interest in Aboriginal health as well. So worked at AMS in Redfern, worked in some private practices, some semi-corporate practices. And I learned heaps of stuff by just jumping around to these different places. Everyone had different methods of running their business. Everyone had different types of patient bases. And so after I did that for about 18 months to two years, I went back to Annandale and I said, all right, I'm ready to buy the practice. What do I have to do? Um, and that kind of took me on this trajectory to try and make my own change, I guess, in the industry outside of what I thought was being done wrong. And so how did you identify that gap? So you looked at the dental industry, I mean, which any company and business owner can do. They can look at their industry and they can identify a, potentially a gap, something that's wrong or some a group of people that are being served or something that's being done incorrectly. How did you do that? I think it wasn't immediately when I took over Annandale. I did notice that when I bought Annandale, it was like an old man's dental practice. It was, it smelt funny. It was carpeted. The physical structure of the space attracted a demographic of people that related to that. It wasn't a match for me. So I, I knew immediately that when I bought Annandale, like the day I signed, I had builders in there ripping out everything and starting from scratch because I wanted to reinvent the demographic of patients that were coming in to see me. I wanted to enjoy my work. I wanted people that came in that I could have a wine with if I wanted to. Um, and that's where we're at now. People are like, let's have a champagne on the weekend or if you're a bit stressed out, we can take you out to dinner. And these are patients and you don't often get that relationship with people. But I realised if I created an environment that was representative of myself, then I could attract people that were also like me. And that's kind of where I became really interested in this idea that we're all individual. We're not treating teeth, we're treating people. And what type of people do we want in our spaces or that we want to work with to create a really enjoyable working life? I think the idea of enjoying my clients, you know, serving people like me is one that's so um, underrated. Mm. Like, you know, I think it was... To bring up Mark again, yeah. and he says a lot of wise stuff to me, but I think it, I believe it was him that said to me that every business should serve a market that's either who they are or who they were mm. at one point. And I, I've always really liked that statement. And I like the concept of, you know, your work is basically your life. Yeah. Most of your awake, it, it, as a business owner, it is without a doubt yeah. your entire life. But as, um, as uh, but even work in general, most of your awake day is is at work. If you hate the people that you're serving or that you're working with, like it sets you up for a bad life. Yeah. I so really, building a business that is going to attract people that you actually genuinely want to hang out with and like, mm. you know, is a key element. For example, a cub and boa, mm. like I hang out with business people all day. Yeah. You know, I love business. They love business. We have a lot in common, and it makes for a really enjoyable time for me. Like. And, and I, I think it, it's about choosing that group. So sometimes it's like, okay, I know what I want to do. Like I might want to be a dentist. Mm. But the next question really is, who do I want to be a dentist for? Yeah. And then that question can also be answered by, who do I actually want to meet? Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like, and how can I build something that will attract those group of people that I want to meet? I agree. I think it's really important. I think even going further in that, it's like one aspect to say, who do I want to serve or who do I want to treat? But it's another aspect to say, like you said before, who am I? Because I think we can't fake who we are and we can only fake who we are for so long if we are doing that. And I think being genuine to yourself allows you to attract then other genuine people that really appreciate what you're offering them. And that's where those authentic connections come into play. And how did you go about, so you said one of the first priorities for you was changing the design of the of the dental studio. Do you also have a studio in Darlinghurst, by the way? Yeah, so Annandale Dental was my first one. I've now got Sage Space as well. Okay, so, um, um, so you, you mentioned that your first... Uh, thing was literally ripping out the space and changing it why was that of high priority to you and how did you know what to change it to I think like I knew who I was and I knew what I wanted to create I knew that the demographic of patients as lovely as they were weren't representative of me um, and I remember walking around when I was trying to build up my books and like at the time I, my boss wasn't supportive it was like I'll take everything find what you can so I'd go to the local coffee shops and I'd go to the local businesses and I'd say, hey, I'm the new dentist around the corner, look at me. And then I'd hand them a card and the card wouldn't be representative of where I was working. And so I said, like, I need a space that when people meet me, they walk into the space and they're like, this is Corbin. And so that's what I managed to create. And I, I mean, it adapted over time. Like I've done two renovations there because the first one was what I thought I wanted. The second one was like, no, this is who I am. But you learn that as you kind of, live in the space and feel the space a lot more. But isn't that amazing though? The, the fact like people often think, Oh, if I do something, it has to be the right thing. Like it's almost never the right thing. It's yeah. always just a step in the right direction. Yeah. You know, like you change your brand cause you're like, Oh my God, my brand sucks. You change your brand. And then like three years later, you're like, Oh, okay, actually we should change it again. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, we grow and adapt as well. Like we travel the world, we meet new people, we learn new things. So it's like, if we're staying in that same stagnant era, whether it looks pretty or not, you know, trends change as well. Like you're going to be influenced by all different aspects. And I mean, dentistry in general, like, I mean, I don't want to say it's gross, but like, how do you handle, you know what I mean? Like, but the average person's not wanting to like look into people's mouths and poke around, you know, yeah. like what, what's the, like, what is de what is dentistry to you? Like how, first of all, can it be gross sometimes? Yeah, dentistry can be yeah, terribly gross. Like we're seeing the access cavity to the body and like you've got people like yourself that brush your teeth and look after yourself. You've got people that are going through really tough times as well that picking up a toothbrush isn't their first priority, it's surviving. And so again, it comes back to like treating the person, not the teeth. And so you see some pretty terrible things. And I've worked around Australia, Darwin, I've been fly and fly out in the Northern Territory. I've done the Cairns hinterland, I've done government, I've done private. So the array of people that I'm exposed to is huge. And you realise how privileged we are, you know, being in Darlinghurst, the type of people that walk past you and you interact with every day. We're so lucky in that aspect, because there's just a whole, a whole demographic of people that are just not it's kind of like the mouth is the is the like metaphor for someone's life or the, yeah, this issue, you know like if if the mouth is suffering they could come from a, a, a worser environment yeah. or a worse situation and i think that's what i've always imparted to my team is like if someone comes in and their mouth is got a lot of plaque and it's not looking pretty the first question isn't or the, you know the education message isn't brush your teeth more floss more because your first question should be are you okay what's happening in life like why are we in this position when we don't have to be? And it's likely because there's something deeper happening for this person. As I said, picking up a toothbrush isn't hard. We've been harped on on all fronts to brush your teeth twice a day. But if someone's not doing that, there's a deeper issue arising. And that's what I feel our job should be is like, what's happening? Are you okay? So it, it really is. I love the concept. Treat the person, not the teeth. Mm. But that's almost getting into like a psychology style viewpoint. Is that a background you've had ever or an interest you've ever had? I don't think I had a background in it and I don't think it was an interest, but I think because of the type of person I am, I've now ventured deeper into this um, patient relationships that I'm having. Like people come in and open up their world to you. Um, and I think that happens to a lot of dentists as well. Like it's, you, people are in a vulnerable position. Um, they're sitting there, it's you and them. And oftentimes 
They can feel guilt. They can feel ashamed. They can feel proud. Whatever it is that they're going through in life, we are that contact where you're like, how are you? And most people in a day-to-day life don't get that question. So I think I've kind of ended up going down that route a little bit more to find out more about people because I think that's the most important aspect of what we do for work. I also think like a typical dentist, you don't go unless you really need to go, typically. Like unless you're in pain or something looks ugly. Like those are the two Mm. reasons you go. But that can't be your – and then they'll charge you good money to fix it. But that can't – that's not the model you want. The model you want and the gap you've seen in the market is, well, we don't want people to get to that point. Mm. We want to prevent them from getting to that point, which means the problem you had to solve as a business was how do I get people in more regularly Mm. for smaller for, for smaller things, yeah. basically. And if, from what I'm understanding is the way you solve that problem is by making the dentist a nice place to go. Yeah, I think it's looking at the physicality of the space itself, I think is really important. I think it's the customer journey, like every single touch point. I think it comes down to also having the right team around you, making sure that all the people are empathetic and understanding of what our overall goal and vision is. So there's a whole lot of points, I think, that dentists quite often stay inside their box. You know, we, don't, we only know teeth. We're a tradie of the teeth fundamentally. Um, we don't know how to run businesses. We don't know how to think outside the box. We're not taught any of that. We're taught how to, you know, analyse a research article, but we're not taught how to do our own taxes. It's, you know, we're very much within our own little realm. And I think that um, through design and creating something, that's where our difference can stand out. And I think every practice should be different because every dentist is different. Every person is different and it should be representative of who they are and what they want to achieve in their life. So your business should represent you. I think so. And I think we rely heavily on third parties, whether that's a construction firm or a design firm or our accountants or a branding agency to define who we are. And often those construction firms will build the same cookie cutter dentist. It can be clean and it can be pristine but it's still the same bench seat, the white walls, the you know palm tree room, the rainforest room, all that kind of stuff because the construction company is representing who the dentist is. The dentist isn't saying, actually, who am I as a person and how can I kind of put this into my space? And you mentioned something important, which was that you, know, you were a trained dentist. You weren't a trained business person. Mm. So was that a big... Um, culture shock to you when you became the owner of the of your first dental practice yeah huge i was 25 oh wow so i was like 25 years old i jumped into a practice that was generating a decent income we had six staff i was used to managing myself and i was like how do i do it what do i do um and so it was just leaning on people that had done it before whether good or bad it was all part of the journey of learning I've always kind of maintained that network is really important. And the other thing, yeah, and the other thing is that everyone you pass, even if it's not a one-to-one meeting, you can pass someone on the street. They can give you a nugget of information. Take it, listen to it, absorb it, and either use it or chuck it away. But so many people have just different ways of thinking. And oftentimes we stay in our lane of how how we think we should think But it's like everyone can offer you advice. Like the person at the coffee shop that says something or you hear something, that could be something that changes your world. You just have to be open to listening to those aspects. Yeah, I I always view it as like the biggest killer is not stepping forwards. Like, And I always say it on this this podcast, which is that there's no one path to success. Like I meet people, I I know the like hyper, hyper successful people that are completely opposite theories on business and ways of actually achieving it. But they both got there. Mm-hmm. Well, they all got there. You know, so there's not one path to success. It, it's about moving. It's about constant movement. Mm. You know, it's constantly stepping forwards. Like, mm. And you might not like the traditional dentist, for example. Mm. Sorry, not that you don't like them. It's just that that's not the type of dentistry you want to have, yeah, 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 dentist yeah. practice you want to have. But doesn't mean you can't t- learn from them. Mm. And even if it's learn what not to do, mm. you know, like, oh, we do it this way because of this. Mm. Well, you might be like, okay, that's interesting. I see what I see why they're doing it that way. I understand why. I empathize why. However, I want to do it differently because. Yeah. You know, so it's not just about learning what to do or it's also about learning what not to do. 
um, and understanding but why they do it that way. I think that's the big thing. No one, everyone's like, ah, I hate that. It's not how I run my want to run my business. Mm. That's not a good viewpoint. Mm. You should be smart enough to be able to be like, okay, I understand why that has happened. Mm. And by understanding why, it's also helping you understand the market, the industry, and a segment of a segment of the customers better as yeah. well. Hundred percent. So, like, it's why is that not what I want to do? Why yeah. do they do it that way? Mm. Like, and then take a step forwards. It doesn't mm. matter if it's right or wrong, but forwards movement is the biggest, in my opinion, is the most important thing. I think also going on that forward movement, I think the forward, the side, the back, the forward, it's, I don't even know what dance that is, but it's the dance where you're stepping always around, back, forward, everything. I think it's that oftentimes, particularly with social media and with the world and with LinkedIn and these pushes for like, I made $100 million in a year and I did this. It's like, it's this false expectation of what people are actually going through. And I think it's like when you get into business and you start realizing like, yeah, great. I went forward for a bit. Then I sidestepped for a bit. Then I've gone back to grow something. Then I'm going forward again. I think your, your end goal will get there. The passion will take you there and your learnings and your open mind. But it is that journey that's never linear. Yeah. And, and, and I, I fully agree with what you're saying. It's, it's when you look at, well, you can't base your business off what you see on LinkedIn. No, not at because all. Because LinkedIn is completely fake, mm. first of all. LinkedIn is the promotion platform. Mm. And it's a great promotional platform. Like, it works very well. But when you're promoting, you're never sharing an issue. You're always like, look how amazing I am. I just opened up a new office. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It might not even be their office. They might just be standing in someone else's. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, that's not the point. The point is, it's the promotional platform. On LinkedIn, everything's perfect. Yeah. I'm so proud. Mm. I'm 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 so grateful that we've got the opportunity to work with this. You know, like everything on LinkedIn is just so nice. Mm. That's not what business is. No, it, pretty much always in business is something dramatically wrong. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Even when you even when you're doing well, there's yeah. there's something wrong. Actually, when we were building Boa, one of the kind of ways we were, um, like one of the things we wanted it to be was like if LinkedIn was the promotional platform, yeah. so the place you kind of boast about your accomplishments, mm. we wanted Boa to be the um, building platform, like the place you um, work on mm -hmm. actually accomplishing those things yeah, yeah. and get help for those things and ask your know, kind of genuine, authentic questions mm. and, and things like that. Because you can't base yourself off of other people. No, like it, not and, at all. And it's what you're looking at them is, pro is fake. Yeah. I, I guarantee it's not real. Yeah, 100%. And I think... The more you delve deeper into all social media platforms, whether it's business like LinkedIn through to social media as well, and the more you deal one-on-one -on -one with those people in reality, you realise that everything that is portrayed is very different to the reality. And I think for us, when we're critically analysing that and looking at that, we learn that, but there's a huge portion of society that still don't realise that. And that's where influence is really powerful and hopefully you create influence for the positive not for the negative, but it's a, such a fine balance of what we're seeing in society at the moment. Yeah, I completely agree. But the, the one way you solve that, the number one way to solve that is by surrounding yourself with other business people. Because mm. when you're actually genuinely friends with other business people, you see, like, even if they're more successful than you or less successful than you or whatever it is, mm. you see firsthand, you're talking to them about, like, oh, my God, I'm having this problem, you're having that problem. Oh, my investors are trying to screw me over. My, You know, like... Mm. Every business has its problem. And when you're talking to other business people, you actually quickly realize, wait a second, the life of business is not what you see on LinkedIn. The life of business is actually the conversations I'm happy, having on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis with my friends, yeah, 100%. essentially, that are also in business. Like, yeah. I think, like, when I joined Club Cub um, previously, what I wanted was to find people that I could relate to, for the good and the bad, to be like, hey, have you been through this? And what I found in that first year was I created such a beautiful network of young business people that are all starting out, some more established than others. But this idea that you can, you know, at the end of the day, be like, hey, are you around? Can we sit down for a second and just have a chat about the struggles that I've gone through today? And I found that really good because most of the network that you create in your life, particularly as a young person, started out from school and then it went into university and everyone took different trajectories in life, corporate very few in small business in my network. 
And so trying to find a small business network was really important to find people that had the good and bad that I could celebrate, but also almost have a cry with sometimes. Yeah. And that's for everything in life. Like, you know, for business, like that's a huge one. But if you like as a dentist too, you also want to be part of a network of a lot of other dentists Mm. to learn about, you know, and and share knowledge on actual dentistry. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's for all elements of your life. And unfortunately, business is so rare that the the percentage of entrepreneurs and business owners out there compared to not is Mm. so small. Mm. So you end up in a situation where you don't want to take work home and stress your family out. Yeah, yeah. You can't talk to your friends about it because they're probably, they they may not be in the same position and, Mm. you you know, you don't want to sound like a dickhead. And so it's kind of like, well, where's my community? Mm, like, where's mm. my business? Where's my third community, my yeah. business community? And the other cool thing about meeting people through business in general, like whether it be through a networking group or not, yeah. just in business, is how often do you make friends as an adult? Yeah, like, right. You, you're not doing it. Yeah. But when you make a new friend, it's a really special feeling. Yeah, like it, it, it's almost like a, ch- a childish feeling. Like, mm. oh my God, I'm so excited. Like sometimes I meet someone, I'm like, oh my God, I want that person to be my best friend. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. and it, it, having those introductions and, and business does that for you. Like yeah. that's one of the key things. Like how many clients are you friends with, for example, now? Yeah, my clients are like an interesting one. Like a lot of people coming in now, the other day, I was having a talk with one of my patients. I've seen the whole family. Her nephew's a dentist, but she's like, no, I'll still come to you. And around the corner, I was like, okay, sure. But she came in and she's like, you know what? I know it's been like tough times recently. My partner just moved overseas. So she's like, you know, me and my husband want to take you to dinner. We know you love food and you always give us these great recommendations of restaurants. So we want to take you out for dinner because we'd love that. We love spending time with you. We, We care about you. And I was like, that is breaking a boundary in the sense of like, I've built a genuine relationship with these people. And for me as a business owner, that's fundamental because not only are they loyal, they're with me on the journey, but personally, there's nothing better than someone saying like, I'm here for you and they still pay you. You know, it's a very different relationship, but we've kind of really kind of blurred the line of the traditional in that sense. I think that also, that what most... Uh, SMEs forget or don't realize is that is the key that is the key strength to being an SME mm. like if you're a corporate well you've got huge economies of scale you could probably provide a better product mm. for a cheaper price mm. is mm. is what happens yeah. and they and they become better at actually doing it so mm. the, the systems and ops are better um well, you can't compete in that manner as a small business typically as as, as an SME typically what can you do you can compete with people. Yeah. You, know, you can compete yourself with winning je- relationships with people. That mm. that can be, that can quite literally be what start. That can be the foundation of your first business. Now, mm. if you're to scale, you can't do that as much. Mm. It does go away. Mm. Um, but what can get you to the point to scale is focusing heavily on building these amazing relationships with your your first clientele, the yeah. clientele of your first shop or your first, you know, 20, 30 clients that mm. are keeping, basically keeping your business running. Like I would argue, I'm still, some of my, some of my best friends are mm. still the first cub members mm, mm. to this day, mm. you know, and I don't get to meet like many new cub members yeah. uh, anymore. For example, um, this is the first time we're meeting. Yeah, yeah. Thank God, because I've heard a lot about you, but, but. But my point is, I'm not able to do that anymore. But I wouldn't even be in this position unless I was a, unless I had those initial relationships, those people that help you out, that write you great reviews, that refer yeah. you people, that stick around the bad times, or that mm. gives you advice. Hey, you should do this. You know, like it's so crucial. Yeah, I also think going on from that and kind of looping back in a circle is those key relationships at the start and what you're building is really important. Um, it not only defines who you want to be and who you are and you kind of look at that demographic of people and you say that is me and I really get along with those people and this is why but then as you expand it then comes down to like how do you curate the overall experience whether you're in a small scale or growing that everyone that walks in your door at practice a b c d ends up having that same experience and that's where it comes to like the people that you hire in your team, the authentic nature of how you train those people and say, does our ethos, does our vision all align? Because if it does, that's when you can replicate to create growth. I think you said it well when, you know, the big corporates and stuff 
are efficient. They have their protocols and procedures. Everyone knows what's happening. Their cost per person is much less, but they don't have the heart behind them. And I think that small businesses, even growing up to corporates, if you've got the heart behind it and you keep that heart in every single person that's joining your team, I think that that can replicate success on a grander scale but still feel intimate for every single individual that's coming to the space yeah well uh, but also that is what big businesses figure out how to do Mm. it's replication so it's like how do i take one shop Mm. and how can i have 10 shops that all provide the Mm. same experience yeah and that comes down yes people but but i actually think more so it's operations yeah it's operations and training it's Mm. because what happens when you start hiring so many people Mm it becomes harder to, like, for yeah. example, you can't wait to hire, if you're waiting six months to find the right person, yeah, you've yeah. delayed six months of, of you know, launching a business or yeah. launching something new or providing a new service, or and, and that six months is costly. Mm. So I think it comes down, my opinion anyway, is that the, it's the operations. Because mm. once you can replicate, mm. so, for example, you've got two, mm. two um, um, uh, clinics now. Yeah. Like, you're running two clinics that I'm assuming have a very similar... Yeah. Um, experience for the people. Yeah. Now, like, I, I'm sure you've got ambitions to open a third, but how you do that is going to be very different to how you potentially open the tenth. Yeah. You know, like, and then how do you run ten? Yeah. So it becomes like not just how do you replicate the model, but then now it becomes well, I'm not running one, I, I, I'm not running a corner shop, I'm running a shopping center. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then the, the problems evolve towards management. Yeah. You know, it's like okay, how do I manage ten of the same business that I currently have. Yeah, yeah. How do I manage them to ensure that the um, experience is the same for each of those customers walking in those 10 things and that yeah, the exactly. owners of those shops or my partners in those shops are upholding our values. Yeah. And you know, like business is amazing. I absolutely love it. I, I like even just describing that, like, you know, you've got two clinics, mm. you could easily have 10. Yeah. You know, like there's nothing stopping you. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's true. Isn't it? Yeah, it's just it's just you hustling forward. I think grit, resilience, having all those attributes. And, I, and as I said earlier and as you reiterated, like just listening and surrounding yourself with the right people to allow you to grow yourself and then grow in the right network of supportive people. Yeah, yeah. You know what I read recently? That your mouth is the uh, – so uh, I don't want to sound like an idiot here. But I read something about it was your mouth or your the mouth bacteria or the healthier mouth that is the number one dictator or predictor of if you get sick or not regularly. So something about your mouth's bacteria causes you to get sick more than any other way. Is that true? Yeah, like to an extent. So the microflora of the mouth, we've got so much bacteria living in the mouth, good and bad. Obviously, you always want it to be tipping towards the side of good over the side of bad. That's where you get decay, you get gingivitis, you get periodontal disease or gum disease, things like that. Um, But I think there's a lot of links now and a lot of research that goes into the deep connection between the oral microbiome and the bacteria living in your mouth and things like cardiovascular disease or heart disease and things like that in the long term. I think that education in Australia isn't great from a young age to for people to really understand the link. Like this is the thing where we put food in every day is the only access cavity where things are going in and yet we treat it as if it's like invincible. We don't often think about like, you, you know, you don't use your car every single day and not get it serviced. We always know like I don't want to break down. What's going to happen if the car breaks down? But with our mouth oftentimes – People are using it every single minute of every day. We're talking, we're eating, we're clenching, we're grinding, and yet we never see a dentist. And so I think that's just there's a, just a gap in the market of education about people understanding the importance of what our mouth does and how it functions and what we need to do to keep it you know, nice and healthy and what's actually going out. And I think the divide happens when, you know, it's not coming from our education system. Dentists are looking at treatment over prevention. Uh, corporate, you know, health funds and stuff are all kind of just you're a number. You know, you might get two free cleans, but what does that actually mean? Where are you going? So I think there's a whole lot of failures in the system that still aren't focusing on educating the person and finding out how we can tailor that education to each individual one-on-one with the clinicians working with them over this broad, like, brush your teeth. 
as I said, everyone knows that, but people still aren't doing that. So how do we break that barrier down? And you said, so you said there's good bacteria and bad bacteria in the mouth, similar to the gut. I yeah, guess. it's the same. Yeah. How how does one actually create like what creates bad bacteria, and how does someone help good bacteria grow in your mouth? So there's like some new research coming out with like oral um, probiotics that you can take to try and balance out the good bacteria. But other aspects is brushing your teeth. Like you put something in your mouth that has food. The food um, is what feeds the bacteria in your mouth. Oftentimes, most people will have hopefully tipping towards good, but if we're feeding and we're not brushing, those good bacteria become infiltrated with the bad. They're basically building cities on every single tooth. You've got your tooth, you've got all these cities starting to grow. You don't irritate that city and get rid of it. The bad continues to retain there because the bad is what's fed by food. So so the good bacteria in your mouth doesn't eat the food? It, it does. It's just that most of the time... It's our oral hygiene and our oral practices, like our practices that we're doing at home that are going to be disrupting the bad bacteria. The good flourish and they can only stand so long against the bad. It's like always a war. It's always a war happening in your mouth. Like if we zoomed in, it's this huge active war. And it's like they're always battling, but also this, the bad bacteria grow exponentially faster than the good can withstand. So as soon as that gets too big, everything else drops down and that's where the dentist comes in or your brush comes in or whatever it is, but there's only so far your toothbrush can take you before you need treatment from the dentist. And essentially once you have too much bad bacteria, that's when all the disease start, yeah? So yeah, you know, holes, gum disease, all that stuff. That's all from bad bacteria. Yeah. So if you don't have bad bacteria, you can avoid those diseases. Yeah. And in the caveman days... There was obviously no dentists. Mm. So I assume their teeth would just fall out or they died at the age of like 30. So it didn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, life expectancy was much less. But at the same time, like what you find even in like rural or remote communities is that if people's diet isn't as high in superficial, uh, in artificial sugars. So back then you're eating raw meats, you're eating things like bones. I mean, traditionally back in indigenous culture, they're using charcoal to clean their teeth, the abrasive nature of charcoal and bark. So there was attributes of that that were coming through back in the day, but the diet is a huge thing that's changed. Like we are so reliant on processed sugars now and fast foods that are basically fueling the rise in dental decay and dental disease. Whereas back in caveman's time, that wasn't something that was around. Okay, so a lot of it is just the sugar we're eating. Huge sugar. And and how, how does bark and or coal, how does that clean teeth? I mean, the abrasive nature of it. What do you mean like, abrasive? Like a, the rough, like you're rubbing. If you use your fingernail and you clean all your teeth. I mean, when you go to the dentist, they don't get the toothbrush out and brush your teeth. They use a whole lot of other instruments and tools that are usually more scraping or moving actions. So... It's the same back then. It's like you scrape your fingers on your teeth, you mm-hmm. clean off the plaque, you can get rid of most of it. But um, that same attribute is what they applied back in the day. Yeah, it's just amazing how humans, like, we're getting older mm. and we're getting better at getting older. Mm. And, like, that's not just with, like, food and, like, medicine and, you know, like fixing bone breaks and things like that. Mm. Literally, we have to get better at making sure our teeth last from instead of 30 years, mm. our teeth have to last 100 years or yeah. like 80 years, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, we're almost upgrading every part of it. We're having specialists in every part of our body to help us like actually get to that age. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, as I said, the biggest introduction, like the introduction of refined sugars, is what has basically caused a lot of the dental disease at the moment that we face, um, particularly in terms of uh, dental decay. And I think that, with the lack of education, is kind of fueling this whole treatment cycle. Saying that, though, society is getting better. We're more educated now. We have access on our phone to absolutely everything, whether good or bad. We understand the importance to some extent of Mm. oral health. So the next generation coming through, the hope is that if you are able to maintain regular appointments with your dentist, and even if not, you can retain your oral health at home, you should be better off than your parents and your grandparents were. And I think it comes to that evolution of treatment philosophies as well. Like gone are the days of everyone's teeth getting taken out and dentures popped in or drilling out all your holes and putting in amalgam fillings. We're now very, very preventative focused to an extent. Those fillings were supposed to be very bad for you, weren't they? Isn't that like a new thing? Um, The amalgam fillings like reached their 
as they reached their, I guess, absolute as far as they could go in terms of development. Um, they were good for what we had at the time. They're strong, they're retentive, they solve the problem at hand. They have mercury which releases. Which isn't good. Which isn't good. Yeah. But at the same time, I think that, you know, the mercury being released in a filling that's 50 years old is negligible in comparison to like removing that filling and the amount of mercury that's released with the vapors and aerosols. So I think um, the gone are the days of placing them. Public health might still place some of them in instances where um, a white filling isn't suitable, but most practices nowadays will be placing white fillings. And you've mentioned a few times that you've got a, a deep interest in the Indigenous community. Mm. What's caused that? I went to uni at JCU, so up in Cairns. So I moved from down south up there, um, and JCU had a hugely regional, rural and remote focus. Um, we learned not only about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, but we learned that the healthcare system and managing um, people in community is very different to trying to harp onto somebody in the city about brushing their teeth. You go out to, um, I went to Minyeri, which is in the middle of the Northern Territory, and there's no ownership as such. Everyone shares, like houses are shared, food is shared, community is shared, culture is shared. And so when you tell someone, here's your toothbrush, go and brush your teeth, that's yours. It's not yours. Everything's everyone. So it's, it's you have to adapt your learnings and your education to the people and it comes back to that whole thing of like you're working with a person you're not working with teeth and if we adapt that and understand that you know remote communities indigenous communities are different um, in how they're understanding what we're trying to teach them then we can really create positive impact in those environments as well so how did you overcome that then because so, obviously it'd be worse if everyone was just sharing a toothbrush because then you're just spreading bacteria. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to working with community on how they learn and adapt. It's not walking in there and saying, this is how you should do it because this is what I told you to do. It's saying, right, who's our health liaison officers and how can we create local education to make sure that people are understanding from your perspective what they should be doing. A lot of it is oral health promotion and it's not using my own expertise to tell people that is working with a community to do that. Yeah. No, that, that it, what I love about you is that it's like your passion and your mission and how you want to do it is all so aligned. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you always know when a great business is great because the owner is so aligned with their, like, I, I don't know if it's the mission or if it's like, like you're all about being preventative. Like mm. it's basically all about, it's almost like common sense. Like, mm. it's kind of like, guys, don't wait until your tooth fucking falls out. Mm, yeah. Like, let's just not let it fall out. Like, but, but I think that's a big paradigm shift in healthcare in general. 100%. Like, healthcare in general is like, if something hurts, take this pill. Yep. Like, it's never like, okay, what can we do to make sure that thing doesn't hurt? Why is it hurting? Let's fix the problem as to why it's actually mm. hurting as opposed to just covering up the hurt. Like, yeah. like, I think our whole healthcare system is just cover it up. Mm. It's like a Band-Aid situation not even band-aid because that's that's actually quite useful it gives time things time to heal and things but like but but it's all just cover it up yeah you know whereas you really want to switch that and you're doing that in dental um with preventative how do you actually get people to come in regularly enough i think so that was like when we're looking at design when we're looking at education when we're spending more time with you know each individual but at the same time, I can't open up another daggy dentist on the corner and say, come on in for your checkup and cleans. We've told you to do it. Like every dentist has been telling somebody to go back every six months for the entirety of since dental practices were around and people still don't do it. So it's like we look at that self-care movement, like you were saying, like self-care is becoming on trend at the moment, I guess. It is, yeah. And so it's like how do we create dentistry as an act of self-care and almost like a little daily ritual of brushing your teeth? How do we reinvent and basically promote the idea that brushing your teeth isn't a chore or going to the dentist isn't a chore, but we rebrand that as this is a moment of self-care. This is a moment where you're looking after yourself and you're turning that mundane appointment into a six-monthly ritual. And I think that's where creating the brand and creating something that's really strong and can last is imperative to how we make change because we can't harp on to people. It's not worked for decades. I met this guy... His name's Justin. Mm. 
he owns a company and, and actually they've got a really big podcast. It's called What the Flux. Have you mm. ever heard of it? No. You should check it out. It's yeah. five minutes a day. It's five minutes daily of the most important business information, basically. Um, and he was saying, so he was telling me about, I just find it really relevant to what you're saying. Yeah. He was telling me what, what they wanted to do was make a financial literacy and like the information you need to be a grown up, basically, mm. make it as culturally relevant as like music mm -hmm. or movies. Mm -hmm. So make it culturally relevant. And it's kind of like what you're saying. It's like, it's, it's like making, yeah, making dental hygiene culturally relevant. Mm. Like this is part of the current culture. It's not just about waiting till your teeth is falling out of you. Part of being a healthy person these days is making sure you have clean teeth. Yeah. And, and, um, and the other thing that I think could be used a lot is like vanity, mm. you know, what's more attractive than someone that has beautiful teeth and don't, mm. doesn't have bad breath. Yeah. Like, you know, if you can sell, you don't go to the dentist every six months, your teeth might be looking a bit dingy mm. and your breath might smell and people aren't going to like that. Yeah. You know, like, okay, I'll go to the dentist. Yeah. You're like, yeah. People pay good money for, for is vanity the word, but. No, I think that's true. I think that's why there's been such a big influx of cosmetic dentistry occurring because people are really conscious and social media has told people look a certain way, be a certain way, this is what's beautiful. And so people are going to get veneers and things like that. The preventative side hasn't taken off as strongly because having a clean isn't as sexy. You don't walk out with a dramatic change overnight or after an hour appointment. But it comes down to that and what we're trying to promote at my new sp space is that the perfect imperfect is what makes us the individual. Unique. Like if we're all cookie cutter replicas of the person down the road because the dentist uses the same laboratory for their 1,500 veneers they do a year, everyone's got the same teeth. Whereas it's like let's embrace those small imperfections to create those intricate detail differences between you and me. And I think that is a cultural shift as well. That's a bigger battle to kind of try. But, you know, one person can change the world, why not me? And I think that's like the big thing is just keep pushing at it. I absolutely love that. And I think that's a good place to end. Are we on time, Laura? Um, well, like I've been saying, I need to walk. Actually, can you just – is Sage Space – much different to um, Annandale uh, Dentistry? Is that a new concept? Yeah, or new do you, concept. You, can you share that before we finish? Uh, about Sage? Yeah. Yeah, so I think both are similar in the sense because they're both run by myself. But I think Sage Space really hones in on the idea that prevention is key to avoiding both cost, pain, and disease. Um, and smelly breath. And smelly breath. I think that a huge aspect of what we're trying to create at Sage Space is experience-driven dentistry. As I said, is taking away from this mundane chore of going to the dentist and, you know, you know it's on a Monday morning, you're like, oh, God, I don't want to go to the dentist, to saying, actually, this is what I vibe. Like, I really loved it last time. The experience was curated to me. Um, the space was beautiful. The staff were educational. Um, everything smelt good. There was no loud noises. It was just... Every single touch point was for me, not for the business. And so Sage Space is kind of blurring that line to say, come in, you'll have your wow moment when you walk through the door and then you're going to have another four or five wow moments before you leave. And then when you do leave, you say, I'm going to go back in six months. I want to go back in six months. And that's where it's one patient at a time, but that's where our impact is being had. That's awesome. Well, we need to lock me in. Yeah, hundred percent. Because I'm just in Potts Point, <laughs> yeah. so we need to lock me in. I've been saying it for a month or two, but but let's actually do that right after this. Yeah, I've got to come. Uh, I can't wait to come down. Um, it's almost kind of like you know when women go get their hair blow dried and they love it. Like it's like okay, yeah. I can't wait to go get my hair blow dried. It's almost like you want to create that experience exactly right. feeling, but yeah. for going to the dentist. Exactly right. It's like thinking outside the box. It's not harping on to people and lecturing them it's creating something that they actually enjoy and if they enjoy it they go back it's spas it's massages it's you know blow dryers everyone enjoys that stuff even if you go to a massage and it's a bit sore you're still like i love that so it's that same principle that we're applying to dentistry it's like you can love it but we have to create the environment for you to be able to love it do you know what i think is a big barrier Mm. is because when I, whenever I get my teeth cleaned, I'm always so happy. I can literally feel how clean they are. My mm. mouth feels great. I can feel the dents behind my teeth better, like, you know, because yeah. they're, they're more... Uh, yeah, you can feel each individual tooth. Yeah, you can feel each individual tooth. Yeah. You, you just feel like a champion. Yeah. But booking a haircut or a massage is almost... It's just easier to kind of book 
Mm-hmm. So you kind of do it. I reckon if you remove the difficulty of I've got to call the dentist, figure out the like, okay, do I, you know, when do I do this? Or mm. can I, you know, make it more of a, a, a fun or easy booking. I reckon that would have a big impact. Yeah, I think there's a lot of softwares that are coming into dentistry at the moment. I think a lot of the time it's been around clinical softwares, but I think now we're starting to see more companies come in and use like artificial intelligence to analyze x-rays, for example, and for us to then show you that x-ray and explain it in layman's terms really easily so you see what's happening. I think that there's a lot more software companies for bookings, patient management, retention, all that kind of stuff coming through. It's still lagging the rest and all the other industries, but it's slowly, slowly, slowly getting Yeah, it there. doesn't even have to be digital booking, but like when you call up, you know the person at the front, mm. like, oh, yeah. hey, yeah. is there a time? Can I come in tomorrow? Oh, yeah, yeah we've got one spot. We're coming, you know, like 100%. making it that fun experience. Yeah. Anyway, we do have to wrap up, but um, um, to our listeners, if you want to get in contact with Corbin, and I highly, highly um, uh, encourage doing so because I'm going to Sage Space and you should too. Uh, go to cup.club forward slash podcast and you can find Corbin's contact details there. Um, if you want to catch up with Cub on social, it's at Club of United Business uh, on Instagram. It's also awesome. Corbin, thank you so much, man. Pleasure. Thanks uh, for having me. It was so good to finally meet. Yeah, you like, too. We messaged on the Cub app a few times and, and, um, and here we are. Now I know all about you and your business. Cheers. Thanks. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the show.